We all fear the metabolic slowdown, the dreaded slowing of our metabolism. From the time that we're about 20 years old, we start thinking about it. Oh, when I turn 30, my metabolism's gonna slow down and it's game over. Or the other side of the equation, oh, I've been in a caloric deficit and I'm dieting for so long, eventually my metabolism is going to slow down. It does not have to be that way. If you live by conventional dieting wisdom, then yes, you will end up down that road of a slowed metabolism. But I'm going to give you some tricks here, and they're nothing crazy. It's just lifestyle just factors, things that you can do differently with your timing, with your cheat meals, with your workouts to prevent the dreaded metabolic slowdown. Hey, but before we dive into that, I wanna make sure you hit that red subscribe button, hit that little bell icon to turn on notifications, and then cool stuff, down below in the description, I put a link to Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a membership-based grocery store, but I've been able to create all kinds of different grocery bundles with foods that I think are good and healthy. So keto boxes, fasting boxes, everything like that. Hormone optimization, metabolism optimization, just foods that I think are great, and I put them into specific grocery bundles. So this way, you can get your groceries delivered to your doorstep. You don't have to go to the grocery store, and you can get what Thomas would recommend if you want to check them out. So check them out down below in the description. But now, let's educate to prevent that metabolic slowdown. The first thing I want to talk about is cheat meals. Okay, people think that they should diet for six days out of the week and then have one day a week or one meal a week where they have a cheat meal and that's going to save their metabolism because they're spiking their metabolism. I have to be honest with you, I'm not anti-cheat meal, okay? I think they have their place, but we have to look at cheat meals differently. It's not about cheat meals. One day isn't going to cut it. One meal isn't going to rev up your metabolism enough to prevent it, uh, the slowdown, right? It's not, that, it's not the way it works. It's more about having longer periods of time of elevated calories to maintenance level, followed by spontaneous caloric reduction, okay? Fat loss occurs from spontaneous caloric reduction not from just continual caloric reduction. If we continually reduce our calories, eventually we'll be eating peanuts and we'll still be gaining fat, right? Okay, that's the theory and that's really kind of what it comes down to. So we need to be able to have longer periods of time. Now, I encourage you to look at it like this. From an evolutionary standpoint, if we were to go out and we were to, I don't know, kill a lion, let's just say that, you're not gonna just have food for one day you're gonna have a surplus of calories for probably a couple of weeks because you're not gonna go through a whole lion in one day, right? So the point here is that we have to live based on that. If we have periods of caloric restriction, then we have periods of calorie maintenance. This gives our hormones a chance to optimize and balance, particularly in the way of leptin. Now I'm gonna talk specifically about leptin here in a minute, but let me tell you quickly what it is. Leptin is the phone call from your fat to your brain. Okay, if you have fat on your body, it calls your brain and it says, hey, we have fat, go ahead and turn up the metabolism. If leptin is not there, if leptin is low, there's no one to call the brain to turn on the metabolism. So the metabolism slowly just gets slower and slower and slower. Okay, so let's talk about this really interesting study. Okay, this one was published in the International Journal of Obesity and it's called the Matador Study. It is a famous study and it's really wild. So what this study did is it took a look at two groups of individuals that dieted for 16 full weeks. Okay, one group dieted for 16 weeks straight through at 67% of their maintenance calories, meaning they took what they would need to maintain weight and they gave them 67% of that so they'd lose weight. The other group also dieted for 16 weeks, but every two weeks they took a two week break up to 100% of their maintenance calories. So it looked something like this, calorie deficit for two weeks, maintenance for two weeks, calorie deficit for two weeks, maintenance for two weeks. Their overall dieting time was still only 16 weeks, okay? They still, both groups only dieted for 16 weeks, but the results at the end were just flabbergasting. It's crazy. The people that took the diet breaks ended up losing 14.1 kilograms versus the group that didn't take the diet breaks only lost nine. And they lost significantly more body fat than the other group too. So they both dieted for an effective 16 weeks but the group that took breaks ended up losing more weight overall. And guess what? The likelihood of them keeping that weight off was significantly better. So long-term, they ended up with a better result. So if you're looking at preventing metabolic slowdown, it just makes sense. Now, another study that was published in the International Journal of Obesity found that simply spiking your leptin with one decent meal can increase leptin by 30%. Now, again, here's a very important thing to remember. 
Leptin is important for regulating and just elevating our metabolism, but it is not the end all be all. I have to be very clear when I say this. In order for lipolysis to occur, for fat burning to truly occur, leptin has to get low, okay? So it has to be elevated enough to get our metabolism going, but then it has to get low spontaneously and periodically for lipolysis to occur. So the goal is to get our leptin nice and high so that we can drop it, so that when we do drop it, there's a significant contrast. Okay, so think of it like this, just visually. You have leptin here, and then you spontaneously reduce calories through dieting. You have that much of a drop. Now, in the other situation, you have leptin way up here, and then you spontaneously reduce calories, and whoosh, you have that big of a drop. You see my point? So it's not always about trying to keep leptin elevated. It's about the contrast between how high we get leptin and how low we can get it. So it's all that balance. So I don't want you thinking we just constantly spike our leptin. It takes days and weeks to get our leptin levels to where we really want them chronically so that the dieting can actually take an effect. So it's all a balance and it should all be looked at to scale. So what my recommendation would be on this would be, well, quite frankly, intermittent fasting is perfect. Do periods of time where you eat for a week without fasting and then do a two day fast. I mean, honestly, I know some people would say that that's extreme and that that's more like a binge eating and an eating disorder. I say that's reality. Okay, as long as you're not having just a mental issue with it, then it's totally fine. That's a strategy, but that whole premise makes sense. Now, I will say, cheat meals are still okay, but cheat meals are emotional. It's, you have a cheat meal because you wanna have a cheat meal. You don't have a cheat meal because it's necessarily a strategy. Okay, you go through maintenance form of calorie increase for strategy. Cheat meals, if you want cake, eat a freaking piece of cake and enjoy your kid's birthday. Those of you that have been around on my channel for a while know that I lost over 100 pounds. Okay, the reason that I'm able to maintain this 10 years later is because I don't work out for long periods of time. I can honestly attest that that is probably the biggest reason in terms of my workouts. I am in and out fast. I hit it hard, I hit it intense, but I don't go for such a long period of time that I trigger chronic inflammation inside my body. Inflammation as a result of trying to recover from workouts will, I promise you, slow down your metabolism. So let's take a look at an interesting study. So this one was published in the American Journal of Physiology. It was really wild. Okay, so it took a look at three groups, a sedentary control group, it doesn't really matter, a moderate intensity group, and then a high intensity group. Now the differences between the two is they worked out for 30 or 60 minutes and burned 300 calories versus 600 calories. Here's what's wild. At the end of the study, their overall fat loss was about the same. Body composition results were about the same, but the group that exercised at a higher intensity exercised for half the amount of time, burned more calories, and ultimately had a better result with less inflammation on their body. So it's really interesting when you look at this because then you're like, okay, wait a minute. I can still lose a lot of weight. I can still get the optimal metabolism that I want, but I can also prevent myself from breaking down. Nothing is gonna slow your metabolism down more than an injury because you've just been spending two hours in the gym, okay? Just, just simple thing there. There are so many things that I could go on and on about, but there's a one more that I really wanna mention because I'm trying to just talk about the big picture lifestyle things. And this one's a little bit more tactical. Apple cider vinegar, my friends. This sounds crazy and it sounds like I'm just trying to push a product and I'm not, I'm not even gonna say a brand name. The point is the acetic acid in apple cider vinegar does some things to our cells involving what is called AMPK, which I will explain in just a minute. But first, let me reference a study. So this study was published in the Journal of Bioscience, Biotechnology, and Biochemistry. Really wild stuff, 144 participants, okay? And they divided them into three groups. One group had one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar per day, one group had two tablespoons per day, and one group had a placebo. Well, guess what? They did this for 12 weeks and they found some pretty interesting results. The one tablespoon group lost 2.6 pounds at the end of 12 weeks. The two tablespoon group lost 3.7 pounds at the end of 12 weeks. Placebo group lost no weight. Okay, fat loss results were pretty darn close as well. Fat percentage was 0.7% loss in the one tablespoon group and 0.9% loss in the two tablespoon group. Just by adding some vinegar? Okay, well, what is it doing? It all has to do with AMPK. So let me make this simple and short and sweet for you. AMPK is involved in, uh, it's like an energy sensor. So AMPK can sense in a cell if there's energy in the cell. So basically, if you aren't eating right now, AMPK will say, uh-oh, we gotta activate, and that activation of AMPK is gonna trigger uh, autophagy, it's gonna trigger fat burning, it's gonna trigger all kinds of things that we want. 
However, AMPK, when it gets elevated in the brain, in the hypothalamus, does something different. In the brain, it makes it so that you are craving food because it tells the brain, hey, you're starving, you need to eat. So in essence, we want high levels of AMPK in the body and low levels in the brain. Apple cider vinegar, for one reason or another, does this. Apple cider vinegar lowers the AMPK in the brain, but because when it enters the cell in our body, it activates and starts the, turns into something known as acetyl coenzyme A, that basically uses an ATP, it uses some energy. All that means is it basically triggers AMPK to get activated and triggers all these fat burning processes to occur. It is awesome, awesome stuff. And you literally just need a couple tablespoons of it. It is a huge part of my life and it should be a big part of yours in combination with the practical lifestyle advice that I gave you within this video. So as always, please do keep it locked in and make sure you check out Thrive Market down below in the description and I will see you soon and thank you for watching. Comment any other ideas for videos. See you soon.